Namaste. Let's close our eyes for a moment and follow our breath. Let's follow our breath gently and follow our breath all the way along. Keep your eyes closed for a little longer, if you wish, to experience a little bit deeper. Welcome everyone. We are so excited to have you here with us today. We are looking forward to listening to Dr. Satpir Khalsa share his knowledge and wisdom with us. My name is Lalit Jairat. I'll host this session with Monique Vishrapper. We are both yoga instructors and co-organizers of this event, among many other wonderful volunteers. On to you, Monique. Thank you, Lalit. Welcome to the University of Guelph Wellness at Work sponsored yoga speaker series event brought to you by the U of G Yoga and Meditation Collective. We begin this presentation by acknowledging that we are meeting on Aboriginal land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples since time immemorial. As settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet here and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. The University of Guelph resides on the ancestral and treaty lands of the Atawandran people and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And we recognize and honor our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We humbly intend to learn new and unlearn old ways to continually bring into our awareness the responsibility we hold as settlers to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our communities. Let us hold this acknowledgement and commitment in our hearts today as we listen, discuss, and reflect on the offerings of Dr. Satbir Singh Khalsa. We welcome today our special guest speaker, Dr. Sadbir Khalsa of Harvard Medical School. Originally Canadian with a PhD in neuroscience and neurophysiology from University of Toronto, Dr. Sadbir is now associate professor in medicine and associate neuroscientist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School in Boston. Dr. Khalsa is also Director of Yoga Research for the Yoga Alliance, Director of Research for the Kundalini Research Institute, Research Associate for the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine, Research Affiliate for the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine, and Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal of Yoga Therapy. Dr. Khalsa has dedicated his life to educating the general public and yoga practitioners and yoga professionals in the science and research on yoga and yoga therapy. Among other publications, he is editor of the medical textbook, The Principles and Practice of Yoga in Healthcare. Please welcome Dr. Satbir Khalsa. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here, participate in your wonderful speaker series on, on yoga. So my topic um, today is um, the science and biomedical research on yoga, enhancing mindfulness awareness and, and global consciousness. I'm going to talk about um, the science and research behind how yoga works, and then talk about really how that um, has relevant and how that has relevance on a global scale for uh, for society. First of all, I want to sort of make a definition of, of yeah, yoga yeah. and yoga therapy, if you will. And um, this slide shows the typical types of asanas that are involved in yoga practice. 
and um, many people practice um, this type of these types of practices. And Traditional yoga incorporates not just these asanas, uh, but also the breathing practices, the deep relaxation, typically in shavasana, and also the meditative component of practice. And this is what most research is being done on. This is the traditional form of yoga that incorporates these multiple components. So our definition, our working definition of yoga is this larger multi-component uh, aspect of traditional yoga practice. Now, yoga has become very popular. Uh, you can now buy a yoga mat and have an imprint of a car on, on, on your yoga mat. Uh, it's become very commercialized, very popular. A significant fraction of the population is, is, is practicing yoga. Um, and we see this in the survey studies that have been done. Um, and the most uh, comprehensive surveys have been done in the United States. So these are statistics from the National Health Interview Survey. And you can see the percentage of the population of U.S. adults that practice yoga within the past year. Uh, in 2017, that was 14% of the population. But what is also remarkable is the trend. You can see this 50% increase in these two five-year intervals. And if we see that in 2022, uh, when the next survey is presumably scheduled, this if this increases by 50%, again, we will be over 20% of the population. So. This is a really highly significant uh, fraction of the population and, and is uh, really a movement in, in modern society. Now we'll see th this evidence in the media and we can see this in uh, uh, magazine covers. This is Life magazine. This caption reads, dogs do it, kids do it, even desperate housewives do it. Why we've become a yoga nation. Uh, and this cover of Time magazine, The Science of Yoga, with famous model Christine Turlington. And one of the problems with the media portrayal of yoga is that it, it conveys the image that you have to be very flexible and that it's mostly done by women and so on. And of course, this is um, uh, an aberration because yoga is uh, applicable to virtually any population um, and, and can be practiced um, uh, throughout society. Um, yoga has become so popular that we actually have in the United States now five airports and counting which have dedicated yoga rooms set aside within the airport that people can practice yoga uh, in between their flights. Uh, another metric of society is the toys that we have in society and this is even going back archaeologically. Uh, you can get a sense of what you know what was in that culture and here we have uh, in our Western culture the Barbie doll and there's now a Barbie made to move doll and she's made to move so she can practice these yoga asanas. In addition, there's actually a Breathe With Me Barbie that comes complete with five guided meditations. And then if you go on, uh, there, there's also a Yoga Teacher Barbie, which comes complete with a yoga mat and water bottle. And for those uh, with a more male persuasion, um, the toy soldiers have been, placed, have been replaced with Yoga Joes. These are toy soldiers now practicing asanas. Um, Part of the popularity of yoga internationally has been really driven by India, and uh, Prime Minister Modi is a, a real advocate for this. He addressed the United Nations on the topic of yoga in 2014, talking about uh, yoga embodying unity of mind, uh, harmony between man and nature, a holistic approach to health and well-being. It's not about exercise, but to the discover the sense of oneness. And he argued for the adoption of International Yoga Day, which the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted in December of 2014. And India has been promoting this. This is the first celebration in New Delhi. And this is Prime Minister Modi, uh, joined by a few uh, supporters. And you can get a sense of how many supporters from the aerial view. Uh, these are tens of thousands of people celebrating. And India has been at the forefront of really pushing and promoting uh, the celebration of International Day of Yoga since, since that time. This is also 2015. This is a photograph from China. And anything that becomes popular to that degree in society is picked up by the advertising industry. So we now have many yoga images appearing in the advertising industry. And they're using the positive, healthful image of yoga to perhaps sell products. And this, in this case, they're selling a vodka. This is a vodka bottle doing a headstand on a yoga mat. And on the right-hand side, um, this morning was brought to you by a good night's sleep. They're selling a sleeping pill, arguing that if you take their sleeping pill, you'll be rested in the morning and more willing to do uh, your yoga in the morning. 
And even large corporations have adopted this. This is McDonald's a few years ago. They had a DVD on yoga and um, on a fruit and yogurt cup. You can see this unmistakable image of yoga practice. Um, this is, was a full page ad in Newsweek magazine. I do yoga in my suite. Doctor's orders. It's a good conversation starter at breakfast, almost as good as the complimentary waffles. This introduces a, a sort of a new construct in um, the field of uh, yoga, and that's the whole idea of yoga as a therapeutic intervention. Um, and this is not something that was historically part of yoga. Yoga was never a form of medicine. Um, however, the fact that yoga in, in, in improves uh, psychological and physiological functioning, it was natural that, that people would start to then adopt it for disorders. And so we see the first evidence of this in India at in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, in 1963, the Indian government commissioned this book called Yogic Therapy. And that has now become very popular in India. That popularity came to the West. And now uh, we have a good deal of popularity of uh, many books, including this one here, Yoga's Medicine by my colleague Timothy McCall. There's now even books on yoga for specific disorders, yoga for insomnia, yoga for depression, yoga for cancer, etc. And this has also become well known. This is the cover of Time magazine, How Your Mind Can Heal Your Body with this unmistakable yoga image. Um, and then there is also uh, the International Association of Yoga Therapists based in the U.S. Uh, and this organization accredits yoga therapy schools. It certifies yoga therapists. They have a trade journal. They have an annual meeting. They're very supportive of research. So they support uh, a research conference that I coordinate called the Symposium on Yoga Research. And for almost three decades, they have had a peer-reviewed journal, the International Journal of Yoga Therapy, on which I serve currently as the editor-in-chief. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is really um, on the topic of research. And, and the question is, why should we do research and understand the science behind yoga? And right now, what we see in society is that yoga is being practiced. This 14% of the population is largely doing this in ashrams, studios, yoga centers, gyms, and spas, and so on. But we are starting to see this implementation um, of yoga into mainstream society, into mainstream society's institutions, typically the public schools, workplaces, uh, and the healthcare system. Now, obviously, if we can see this transition happen uh, on a global level, we would see much more incorporation of yoga into mainstream society. And the challenge here really is that the, the, what is needed for this transition to take place is research to demonstrate the safety of efficacy of yoga in these institutions before they can be implemented. So this is why research is so valuable. Um, and right now we have a disparity in terms of the demographic of who is practicing yoga. Uh, typically in, in North America, it's about 70% uh, are women. It's mostly people who are well-educated, mostly people with higher income, and mostly people who are white. So in order to really uh, broaden that demographic, this kind of implementation of yoga into mainstream society uh, would, would be a form of restorative justice, if you will. So now let's turn our attention to the psychophysiology of yoga. What is the research that shows us how uh, yoga works on the biomedical level? And this is a growing area of research that is expanding very rapidly, and it's expanding to the extent that we're now seeing uh, summaries of this for the general public. I was invited uh, by Harvard Health Publishing to serve as the medical editor for this book, uh, An Introduction to Yoga, Harvard Medical School Special Health Report. And in this book uh, is covered a lot of the research that's been done that supports the benefits of yoga practice. And if you go onto the Harvard Health Publishing website, there's actually articles on uh, the science that's been done on yoga, this one here on yoga for anxiety and depression. And this is really remarkable in itself that a major uh, international leading medical school would actually be uh, apparently purport, uh, supporting yoga in this way. Now, in any field that is growing rapidly, the research uh, studies are being done. And one reflection of that is the publication of so-called review papers or systematic reviews or even meta-analyses. Uh, and this is growing sub significantly. And these are uh, reviews specifically addressing mechanisms underlying how uh, we understand yoga to work. This one here on yoga reducing stress, on yoga and immune system functioning, neurophysiological and neurocognitive mechanisms, stress again, and self-regulatory mechanisms for psychological health. 
And we've also published a chapter in our landmark textbook, The Principles and Practice of Yoga and Healthcare, on the research on the psychophysiology of yoga as well. Now, going back historically, some of the early work really began uh, in India uh, in the mid 20th century. Uh, and some of the studies that were done were looking at these advanced practitioners to try and understand what was going on with their physiology. And this was a landmark study. This was a year-long study in which this team of scientists traveled all over India uh, looking for um, uh, what was happening um, psychologically and physiologically with these practitioners. And their conclusion from this study was that physiologically yogic meditation represents deep relaxation of the autonomic nervous system. Now, the autonomic nervous system is one of the stress response systems. It, is, it was called autonomic because it was believed to be automatic. So one thing we can conclude is that yoga seems to have some degree of control over the stress response and emotion response systems. And this is what we call a form of self-regulation. The ability of the training of these types of practices for us to be able to control internal state, both physical and psychological. Now, another example of uh, this is an anecdote um, that was uh, a sort of a, a very informal research study on Swami Rama, one of the many yoga masters who came from India to the West in the, in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. And they had him wired up at the Menninger Clinic, and he was able to demonstrate that through uh, a force, uh, through the will of self-regulation, he was able to increase the skin temperature on one side of the hand while simultaneously decreasing the skin temperature on the other side of the same hand. And this shows the ability to control the autonomic innervation of the blood vessels um, and distinguishing uh, the control from the left and right sides of the same hand. And this is a very powerful anecdote because it really tells us that we have in modern science very little understanding of how deep the ability of humans to control their internal state goes. Uh, and the beauty of self-regulation is that it is really unique to these types of practices. Modern medicine uh, does not have this construct of self-regulation. In modern medicine, the doctor treats you. Um, but here we have a, a practice and a series of practices that allow individuals to control their internal state. Now, obviously, um, these asanas that we practice are very different than Western aerobic exercises. They're much more focused on flexibility. They're much more isometric in nature. Um, and what we can see, of course, in many studies is, you know, very objective measures of these kinds of changes. Um, and so this is one example of many studies that have been done in this realm um, where we see improvements in, uh, in people who have never practiced yoga. After a couple of months of practice, we see uh, measurable and statistically significant improvements in flexibility, endurance, strength, and even oxygen uptake. So this kind of physical evidence is, is very strong with respect to the asanas and how they work. We also have in yoga, of course, the, the ability to generate this relaxation state. We do this in Shavasana. Um, and this whole idea of Physical relaxation has actually been practiced in the West for many decades. It's been called progressive muscle relaxation. It is very similar to Shavasana. And this is just one example of many studies that have been done on progressive muscle relaxation showing effects not only on the physical body, but also psychological functioning. So you can see here in this randomized controlled trial, the, the dark bar represents the progressive relaxation group uh, showing reductions in perceived stress, the control group showing no change. In terms of trade anxiety, you can see a reduction. The control group had no change. Um, sense of relaxation increasing in the progressive muscle relaxation group, less so in the control group. And then objective measures of heart rate. You can see the reduction in heart rate, which is this reduction in sympathetic drive. Uh, no change in the controls. And on measures of stress, uh, the salivary cortisol level. Cortisol is a stress hormone. You can see a reduction with progressive muscle relaxation and no change in the control condition. Now, another practice, of course, is pranayama. One of the most central pranayama practices is long, slow, deep breathing. And we're seeing enormous uh, research with highly significant uh, changes that come about when you do slow breathing. And one of these is the regulation of the autonomic nervous system and the emotion response system. This is a randomized control trial showing that slow breathing immediately reduces systolic blood pressure. And then that recovers to normal after the slow breathing practice is over. 
Another feature of this is the direct regulation of the stress response system. So this is another randomized control trial in which both groups were given a stressful situation. The experimental group practiced long, slow breathing, and you can see a much more blunted increase in the stress response than the large stress response you see in the control group that did not practice slow breathing. And other research has shown that long, slow breathing can actually regulate pain more effectively um, uh, than a control condition as well. And we're also seeing changes reflected in the central nervous system uh, with breathing practices. So there's a, there's a lot of research in this area, and it's really um, very strong and very exciting research. Now, the cutting edge of research uh, in these contemplative sciences and mind-body practices is looking at what happens in the brain. And these are neuroimaging studies using these devices like the fMRI you see pictured here. And one of the types of studies that's been done is to ask the question, do the brains of long-term practitioners behave differently than those of non-practitioners? And this is one of many studies that have shown that indeed. And they did see observed changes, and those changes appear in structures that underlie the attention network, and also those that relate to emotion and autonomic function. Now, this fits very well with the behavioral data because we see the changes in emotion and autonomic function that we see behaviorally, and this is manifested in those regions of the brain. We see changes in the attention network, and that makes sense because meditation is, a, is effectively the control of attention. You are engaging the attention networks in the brain, and as you do this over time, their activity changes uh, and improves, and so you see changes in the attention networks. So clearly, this is demonstrating with very powerful objective measures that we can change brain activity with these practices. Another technique of neuroimaging is capable of looking at a single molecule. In this particular study, they looked at the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA, which is well known to be associated with mood state. GABA levels are low, for example, in depressed patients. And what they did in this study was to image participants before and after a single yoga class. And what they showed from pre, before the yoga class, to post, after the yoga class, was an increase in the levels of GABA in this, in this region of the central nervous system. So this is very powerful objective evidence telling us that yoga practice can actually change brain biochemistry as well. Another phenomenon of the central nervous system is the ability to change its structure with behavior over time. This was a study that was done at the National Institutes of Health in the United States. And they were looking at this, the uh, ability to tolerate pain, uh, and in this case, cold pain. And they looked at long-term yoga practitioners who are displayed in this graph in the black dots. And what you can see is that, that they are clustered at the higher end of cold pain tolerance, whereas those who, individuals in the study who were not yoga practitioners are in the open circles are clustered at the lower end of cold pain tolerance, suggesting that there is something about yoga practice that enhances one's ability to tolerate pain. The other thing they did was neuroimaging of the area of the brain that's involved in pain regulation, and they were able to measure the volume of that region of the brain in all of these participants in the study. And what they showed was that on average, the long-term yoga practitioners were clustered at a higher volume uh, of that region of the brain than were non-yoga practitioners. And to further sort of enhance that, um, they, they plotted the duration of yoga practice, how long the yoga practitioners have been practicing against the volume of that region of the brain. And there's a, there was a correlation suggesting that the longer one, had, one practices yoga, the larger that region of the brain becomes. So this is now very strong objective evidence that not only can we change brain activity, we can change bi brain biochemistry, we can also change brain structure. And these are important findings because these are now very sophisticated modern scientific approaches. And they give us a lot of confidence that these changes that are taking place are real. They're not our imagination, they're not the placebo effect, um, and so yoga can no longer be written off as just a sort of a casual practice. These changes that we see in these sophisticated measures are clinically significant uh, as well as being statistically significant. So this is real science uh, and, and real change that's happening when we engage in these yoga practices. Now, 
meditation, the sort of the one of the more fundamental components at the heart of yoga, uh, really is all about the focus of attention. And when you begin meditation practice, as you begin focusing your attention, you notice after a period of time that you have an intrusion of mind wandering. Suddenly you start thinking about something else. Uh, perhaps what you're going to have for dinner, what you're going to do after you finish meditating, or what you're going to do tomorrow. And then you notice that, and then you bring your focus back to the target of your meditation. Meditation is the focus of attention on a target. And different styles of meditation differ depending upon what the target is, whether that's a single point focus, such as the breath or a mantra, or whether it's the focus on the flow of a sensation or the flow of thought in so-called open focus meditation or mindfulness meditation. So if we really want to understand how meditation works, we should actually study meditation in the real world. And meditation in the real world is associated with these intrusions of mind wandering. So it's important to understand not only the focus phase of meditation practice, but also what happens when we have these intrusions of mind wandering. And this was actually studied by a Harvard research team and published in our uh, premier biomedical journal, Science. And what they found in this study of mind wandering in the general population was that people's minds wandered frequently regardless of what they were doing. So, of course, we're very familiar with this. We're standing at the bus stop. We're sitting in the doctor's office. Our mind is wandering. The interesting finding, however, from this study was that people were less happy when their minds were wandering than when they were not wandering. And so that suggests that the ability to think about what is not happening, in other words, mind wandering, which happens in the future or the past, is a cognitive achievement that comes at an emotional cost. And the reason that there's an emotional cost associated to excessive mind wandering is that one of the targets of mind wandering is what is most important to us, and that is survival. And survival issues are uncertain. So every time you have a thought about survival, there's a bit of a stress response because there's uncertainty involved. And if you engage in that kind of uh, rumination on, on stressful situations, you can ultimately develop a mood disturbance, which can then ultimately turn into uh, a mood disorder. So how does meditation fit into this process? What's the benefit of focusing your attention? Well, the attention networks in the brain can only do one thing at a time. They can either be focusing on the target in meditation, or they can be wandering. So the more time you spend focusing your attention, it's kind of like a mind-wandering holiday. You're free from that negative emotional and stress content. But what is more important in the practice of meditation over time is that you are learning a skill of the self-regulation of your own attention networks. You're learning the ability to control your attention. And ultimately, that leads to a revelation. It leads to a transformation in one's understanding of the mind and how it works. And the most fundamental uh, realization is that you are not your thoughts. In other words, you have thoughts, but that's not who you are because you are capable of stepping back from those thoughts, watching those thoughts, and then ultimately over time developing self-regulation over those thoughts. You end up changing your reactivity to your own thought processes, both emotionally and stress-related. Um, and you end up even with the possibility of changing those thoughts if you choose to do so. So this is really starting to uh, give us a sense of uh, the value of meditation in terms of uh, self-regulation of thought processes. And we can actually see this uh, in a study that was done looking at meditation in the brain scanner in, in, with neuroimaging. And they were able to sh show which regions of the brain are being activated during uh, the different phases of meditation. So during the focus phase of meditation, when you're successfully holding your attention, what's being activated is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And this is in the frontal lobes of the brain. This is the executive regions of the brain where the attention networks are. And so that makes sense. However, when the mind slipped into mind wandering, uh, an entirely different pattern of brain activation takes place. And this has been called the default mode network. And we're now starting to understand the neurophysiological consequences of spending more time in the default mode network or more time in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And what we're seeing is uh, studies that show things like, for example, that long-term yoga practitioners and meditators uh, are less at risk for mood disturbances 
uh, and for psychological conditions. In fact, yoga and meditation are being used as therapies for psychological conditions. We're also starting to understand the circuitry in the brain. So we, we know that there are inhibitory connections between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. The limbic system is where the stress and emotion response are manifested. And so the more you spend time in the attention networks and the prefrontal cortex, the more you're able to self-regulate your own limbic system responses. And the heart of the limbic system is, is a nucleus called the amygdala. So for example, in long-term meditators, the amygdala is actually structurally smaller. And that is because of brain plasticity. Uh, Long-term meditators are less reactive and therefore they activate the limbic system less. That means that area of the brain becomes smaller. So um, this is really revolutionizing our understanding of the neuroscience of meditation uh, and re is really bringing us into a modern biomedical um, uh, confidence as to how these practices uh, are affecting our central nervous system and our behavior overall. Now another field of modern biology that's being applied is so-called molecular biology. And what I'm displaying in this slide is the so-called central dogma of biology. This is the fact that DNA produces RNA, which then produces protein. And that's uh, shown here. Ultimately, that produces the small molecules. And this cascade of events is responsible for every physiological function uh, at the cellular level uh, in all organisms. And what we know is that we can affect these transitions. Furthermore, we can affect the activity of the DNA itself. We can't change the DNA because that's our inherited um, uh, genetics. However, genes can increase their activity or decrease their activity. And different genes are responsible for different functions in the body. A lot of upregulate or increase the activity of genes that might produce cancer tumor. If you engage in the opposite behavior, engage in healthy behaviors, a low-fat diet, get lots of exercise, low levels of stress, you will downregulate or decrease the activity of those same cancer genes. And this is called gene expression. So obviously yoga is a healthy behavior. Is there evidence that yoga can change gene expression? And the answer to that appears to be less. The first work of this kind was done at the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine. Uh, and what they found was that these practices enhanced expression of genes associated with energy metabolism, mitochondrial function, insulin secretion, and telomere maintenance, and reduced expression of genes linked to inflammatory responses related pathways. And once again, this powerful objective evidence is consistent with the behavioral evidence. We have good behavioral evidence that yoga reduces inflammation and reduces stress, uh, stress responsivity. And those same genes are showing um, the appropriate changes um, to match that behavioral change. So this study was done at UCLA on a yoga meditation practice called Kirtan Kriya, and they showed that this practice suppressed expression of inflammation-related genes and upregulated expressions of genes involved in antiviral and immunoglobulin responses. And once again, matching the behavioral evidence that yoga improves immune function showing that those genes are also being um, improved in terms of their activity in the positive direction. Um, another molecular change that we can see is actually on the DNA itself. The ends of the chromosomes are called telomeres. And what we know is that with aging and chronic stress, these telomeres degrade. And that's bad, of course. You don't want your DNA degrading. And there's an enzyme called telomerase that repairs the ends of the chromosomes. This study measured levels of telomerase and showed that the meditation intervention increased levels of telomerase, whereas a simple relaxation technique was unable to make changes uh, similar to those seen with the meditation practice. So these changes are really showing us that not only are we changing physiology, but we're changing this physiology at the molecular and cellular level of our functioning. Now, I've talked a lot about stress, um, and indeed, stress is probably the most uh, immediate and notable impact um, that we can have with yoga and meditation practices. And uh, it's one of the major reasons why people come to yoga. This was a survey study we did in Beginner's Yoga Practitioners showing that stress management uh, was one of the major reasons why people were coming to yoga practice. Furthermore, 
when we gave them a perceived stress measure before and after their beginner's yoga program, we, so, we showed a statistically significant reduction in perceived stress. Um, there have been a number of studies that have looked specifically uh, at changes in uh, stress with yoga practice, and virtually every study that's been done looking at improved, uh, changes in stress have shown improvements. This review paper revealed that most types of yoga have positive effects on stress reduction in healthy populations. Now, many of these studies are done with um, self-report questionnaires, with stress questionnaires. However, there's also evidence that we are actually changing objective measures of stress. So this review, this review paper showed there were studies looking at uh, the reduced evening cortisol um, and waking cortisol, which is a stress hormone, uh, changes uh, in ambulatory systolic blood pressure, heart rate, high-frequency heart rate variability, fasting blood glucose, and blood lipids. And overall, suggesting that yoga practices yield improved regulation of the sympathetic nervous system and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system. And these are the two systems that regulate stress responses. Just to show you some evidence from our research in my laboratory, this was a study that was actually done in Wales, um, in the UK, uh, at, at a, a, a National Health Service building, and these are clerical workers. They were given, a, it was a randomized controlled trial, and the yoga group showed a statistically significant reduction in perceived stress compared to the control group that did not practice yoga. Um, we've also done studies um, here in the U.S. with the Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health, and this was with frontline professionals, typically professionals in high-stress occupations. This was a residential five-day program, and we were able to show reductions in perceived stress at the end of the program, which were maintained at a two-month follow-up, and increases in resilience which were also maintained at a two-month follow-up well after they were at home uh, after the retreat program. We've also seen this same program yield results in education professionals and teachers uh, mostly contributed to this group and that's a very high stress occupation and again we saw reductions in stress in the black bars in the yoga group and in the gray bars the control group had no change and then on the long-term follow-up again we saw uh, improvements in resilience in the yoga group. We've also done a study on Harvard physicians. This was done at a Harvard hospital in Boston and delivered at the hospital a six-week yoga program. And we saw reductions in perceived stress that were maintained at the long-term follow-up, increases in resilience that were maintained at the long-term follow-up. Now, another uh, phenomenon that occurs with yoga practice over time it is an increase in mind-body awareness. And this has also been called mindfulness. And this is a study in Germany that uh, looked at long-term yoga practitioners and divided them up in terms of how much they were practicing. Uh, so there was a high practice group, a moderate practice group, and a marginal practice group that they divided in these long-term practitioners. And they looked at the mindfulness inventory and showed a dose-response relationship such that the more intense practices were associated with higher levels of mindfulness, whereas marginal practice was not any different than those that did not practice yoga at all, suggesting that there's something about yoga and meditation practice that increase uh, this level of mind-body awareness or mindfulness. We've also seen increases in mindfulness scores in our studies in workplace populations. So this is the frontline professionals in the five-day program showing this increase in mindfulness maintained at the two-month follow-up. We also saw it in our education professionals, increase in mindfulness maintained at the long-term follow-up, and then also in the Harvard physicians, increased by the end of the program and maintained at the long-term follow-up. Now, something else that occurs typically with yoga practice over, over a longer period of time is, is the report of these contemplative states of consciousness. And of course, that is one of the historical goals of yoga practice. But we can look at these temporal changes in yoga practice and over the short term, and we're now we're talking about minutes or over a certain, uh, certainly over a yoga class, the sense of arousal reduction, a sense of physical and mental well-being. This has been characterized by Herbert Benson, a meditation researcher, as the relaxation response. It's the opposite to the stress or the fight or flight response. And this can happen immediately with slow breathing, with meditation. Now, as people practice typically over weeks and months, they develop a skill set. They change their behavior. They become more aware. They improve their mind-body awareness or mindfulness. They improve their resilience to stress. 
And this is coming about through this idea of self-regulation of internal state. So this now empowers people to become more functional, and that's why people continue yoga practice. Now what happens to a few people, and this is typically over a longer period of practice, and now we're talking about regular practice over months and years. Many people will report a psychological or philosophical transformation. People will say things like, yoga changed my life. Now they're talking about something more profound, something deeper, a different change in perspective, a change in life goals, a change in uh, life meaning and purpose. And I believe this comes from these deeper experiences that start to occur that may be very brief, but these are these deep experiences of transcendence or oneness. And we can actually do research in this area. So this was a study that, uh, the, the same study that was done in Germany, looking at these long-term yoga practitioners, and they applied a spiritual well-being questionnaire. And on total scores of the well-being questionnaire, you can see that the high-level yoga practitioners, again, are exhibiting the highest scores on spiritual well-being compared to those that practice less. And then on subscales of this questionnaire, on positive psychological uh, factors such as hope, connectedness and experiences of sense and meaning. Again, it's the higher level practitioners that score higher on these positive psychological states. But we can also see these changes over the short term period. These were studies that were done at the Deepak Chopra Center, uh, retreat center. And what they compared was individuals that came into the center and did the yoga and meditation program compared to those that just came and you know basically did a vacation at the center without doing these practices and what you can see on scores of spirituality and non-dual embodiment that the practitioners actually experienced improvements and increases in those scores that were maintained at the follow-up was there were much fewer changes in those that just simply took advantage of the nice environment and we've also seen the short-term uh, change that can occur with young adult musicians um, this was a six-week program that we applied to young adult musicians, and we measured what is called the flow state. Um, this is this experience during um, music performance when individuals are immersed, they merge with the music. There's no distinction between the music, the performer, um, and, and this is a very uh, profound and deep state. And there's a flow questionnaire that we applied and we showed that after six weeks of practice, we could increase the dispositional flow scale scores for the yoga group and uh, also this autotelic experience, this unitive state that occurs during that, uh, that flow uh, experience. So this brings me to uh, a summary slide, which is really perhaps the most important slide in the entire presentation because this is a logic model that really summarizes all of the research that we have with respect uh, to yoga and how it affects us. So again, my definition of yoga is not just the postures, but the postures, breathing, relaxation, and the meditation component. Now, it's through all of four of these, either independently alone or together, as part of traditional yoga practice that we make changes in the physical body and I'm calling this fitness um, and that includes things like flexibility, strength, coordination, balance, respiratory function which leads through the mind-body connection to an overall psychological self-efficacy. It is also through all four of these either alone independently or together in yoga practice that we increase self-regulation of internal state. And the most important self-regulation is with respect to stress and emotion. And over time with practice, this leads to the skill sets of resilience and tolerance to stress and equi emotional equanimity, the ability to manage emotions more effectively. And that leads to an overall psychological self-efficacy. Now it is primarily through the meditative component of yoga practice, the focus of the attention, the engagement of the attention networks, that we increase over time mind-body awareness. Uh, that, of course, is associated with an increase in attention. Mind-body awareness is another term for mindfulness. Because you're increasing the activity of the attention networks, that improves cognitive performance and concentration. But over time with practice, this self-regulation of thought processes leads to a state we call metacognition, the realization that we are not our thoughts, that we have the ability to self-regulate our thought processes. And I would argue that actually metacognition is the underlying principle behind the most um, fundamental yoga text, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, 
which is this whole idea of self-regulation of thought processes leading to this state of metacognition. And then finally, it is mostly through the meditation practices, typically over a longer practice, uh, regular practice, that we see the induction of these unitive states, these transcendent uh, experiences, this flow state, which leads many individuals to this deep transformation, a change in life meaning and purpose. And people will actually change their life goals. Typically, it's a transition from materialistic goals in life to more um, spiritual uh, aims in life. And I'm grouping all of these changes in a box that I'm calling spirituality. So one thing you can see from this model is that we're making changes from the gross level of connective tissue and muscle all the way to the deepest experiences that humans can have. So we have this sort of uh, effect across many, many different functions uh, in the human organism, both psychological and physiological. The other thing we can look at is the research. So the research here on the physical level is very strong. We can measure respiratory function, physical functioning, and this evidence is very strong. Over the past two decades, the, the modern scientific technologies that have been applied in yoga research have really given us enormous insights into how yoga increases self-regulation of internal state and improvements in mind-body awareness or mindfulness. And the weak sister in terms of the research is these changes in spirituality, but it is possible uh, to do this research. It's just very difficult to get the funding to conduct this research. So across this spectrum, we're seeing ultimately these changes in global human functionality with yoga practice from the gross level of physical and mental health and performance to the deeper experiences of stress and emotion regulation, awareness, mindfulness, and metacognition to the deeper experiences of positive behavior, well-being, values, life purpose and meaning, and spirituality. Now we can look at this model and apply it to any kind of circumstance. And there's two circumstances I want to address um, uh, to, to finish my presentation here. And these are addressed at global issues. One of the global issues is the whole idea of yoga as a therapy, yoga as a therapeutic intervention. And the other one is really targeting the whole idea of the environment and climate change. So looking at yoga as a therapy, um, one of the biggest challenges we have in modern medicine is the so-called epidemic in non-communicable diseases. These are lifestyle diseases. These are chronic diseases, things like cardiovascular disease, cancer, chronic respiratory diseases, diabetes, obesity, uh, depression. They are by far the leading cause of death worldwide. In 2016, they were responsible for 71% of deaths which occurred globally. The world is reaching an inflection point. This is from the World Health Organization. 15 million people will continue to die each year from NCDs in the prime of their lives. Most of these deaths tomorrow can be avoided. And these, the risk factors for these diseases are behavioral. Um, and it represents the biggest burden in modern healthcare. NCDs are estimated to count for 88% of all deaths in the United States. And from this National Center for Disease Control in the US, 90% of the nation's cost and annual healthcare expenditures are for people with chronic mental health conditions. Um, there's a whole opioid epidemic, and there's also an epidemic in chronic stress. And this statement here is really astounding. Six in 10 adults in the U.S. have a chronic disease, and four in 10 adults have two or more chronic diseases. So this is really the biggest burden in modern healthcare and in modern quality of life. Um, and so the risk factors for these are physical inactivity, unhealthy dietary choices, unhealthy behaviors such as excessive alcohol consumption and cigarette smoking, and I would add chronic stress. And the problem with modern medicine is that it's not coping well with changing these types of behaviors. Um, it's not suited towards that. Modern medicine is suited towards pharmaceuticals and surgeries, towards twic, uh, uh, quick fixes. And there is no surgery or pharmaceutical that can change these types of risk factors. You have to change behavior. And modern medicine is not good at changing behavior. It's not focused on that. Whereas yoga and our logic model has all of the fitness level where the salvation is taking care of the chronic stress. The mind body, the improvement in changing behaviors in a positive direction, change on healthy diet, change on healthy behaviors. And then finally, spirituality plays a role here as well, because we know that if 
materialistic goals are the focus of many people in society, people are going to be unhappy. There's extensive psychological research that shows that that's the case. So changing our perspective in life and going towards spiritual goals in life will actually also contribute to the reduced in uh, reduction in chronic stress that contributes to this uh, unhealthy mix of risk factors for NCDs. So yoga has a, 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 an enormous possibility uh, for addressing this epidemic of NCDs, especially if we can get the science that can bring yoga uh, into mainstream society, into our schools, uh, into our healthcare system, and even into the workplace. Um, and yoga therapy research is growing. I mean, the research in this area is, is, is increasing dramatically. You can see this curve of the frequency of yoga therapy research publications from our paper in 2015 growing exponentially uh, over the past couple of decades. Um, and looking at another metric of this is the reviews or meta-analyses of yoga that have been published. And you can see again, virtually at the turn of the century, very few, but this dramatic increase. In 2020, there were almost 50 uh, review papers of studies that have been done uh, on yoga for a variety of different conditions and circumstances. We have a number of journals that are now uh, growing, uh, a number of yoga journals. I, uh, I uh, coordinate the International Journal uh, of Yoga Therapy, but there's another journal called International Journal of Yoga, which is uh, publishing more papers, and there are other journals that are appearing that are addressing this uh, body of research, uh, looking at the efficacy of the yoga practices. We've also published this book, The Principles and Practice of Yoga and Healthcare. Uh, this is an edited medical textbook written in scientific clinical language by, uh, uh, contributed by 60 researchers in yoga internationally. So this is really our evidence um, that yoga has a place in modern medicine. This is written in the language of modern bio biomedical science. And then yoga is also part of a broader movement called integrative medicine and health. Um, and there's a consortium that represents the, the leading body in this area and yoga and meditation, as you can see from this screen capture of their website is very centrally uh, involved in, in that process and they hold uh, uh, research meetings. And again, uh, there's much research that's presented on the studies that are being done on meditation, yoga, and other mind-body practices in this organization. So yoga has a, a, a high potential of really contributing to integrative medicine as a whole, which really is uh, one of the solutions for this major um, human problem of non-communicable diseases. And just to show you some examples from research in my laboratory, we've conducted research on yoga for post-traumatic stress disorder. This randomized control trial showing reductions. This is the yoga group in the black bar showing reductions in PTSD scores, improvements in resilience, and reductions in stress. In another study, we combined uh, yoga together with cognitive behavioral therapy also to show reductions in post-traumatic stress disorder scores. We've also looked at insomnia, showing reductions in chronic insomnia with a yoga intervention. So sleep efficiency here uh, in the purple is the yoga uh, going up from uh, below 80%, which is clinically significant, uh, to normative values by the end of the intervention. And then uh, a recent trial that we were fortunate enough to get published in one of the major biomedical journals, Journal of the American Medical Association Psychiatry. This was a three-arm trial comparing cognitive behavioral therapy versus Kundalini Yoga versus a stress education control group for generalized anxiety disorder. And the Kundalini Yoga group was almost as effective as the cognitive behavioral therapy, which is extremely encouraging. This is the first major trial of uh, a yoga intervention uh, for uh, um, this disorder. And the other area that I wanted to talk about very briefly is the relevance of yoga and the environment. And I think one of the areas that, that's relevant to the logic model is actually the spirituality aspect. When you experience this unitive state of consciousness, you experience the world as one. That includes the earth, the environment as well. And when you become uh, have this unitive experience, there's the sense of non-duality. It's no longer me and the environment. I am the environment, the environment is me. And so when you come into that type of unitive state, uh, there's much more respect for that because if you hurt the environment, you're essentially hurting yourself. Um, and, and this is actually starting to, to show up in the literature as well. This is from my colleagues at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine where they argued inter integrative medicine is a good 
prescription for patients and planet. Integrative medicine, integrative health emphasizes lifestyle and behavior change and a biopsychosocial approach fostering interconnections between mind, body, spirit, and social and physical environments. Fundamental strategies and premises underlying integrative medicine have the potential to directly and indirectly positively impact the environment. The authors highlight three specific strategies, an emphasis on prevention that decreases the burden on the energy intensive healthcare system, provision of tools for self-regulation that might lead to lower carbon happiness and environmental friendly lifestyles, and practices that have the potential to enhance pro-social and pro-environmental behavior. They conclude that the fundamental premise of integrative medicine encourages us to stop thinking of ourselves as separate passive recipients of reductive healthcare strategies and instead as active participants in an interconnected biopsychosocial global ecological system. And one of the phenomenon here, not just the spirituality component in our logic model, but the mindfulness component has the potential of mindfulness with respect to climate change. This author concluded that inner transition is emerging as a potential new pathway. Inner transition, as used here, describes change within individuals that relate to their expanded consciousness. It is supported by indigenous, religious, or spiritual practices such as mindfulness. And they go on to say mindfulness and adaptation are more connected than is generally thought. Based on an in-depth liter literature review, this study shows that mindfulness has the potential to contribute to facilitating climate adaptation at all scales, from the individual to the institutional and societal level. It may increase individual and collective capacity to deal with increasing risk and uncertainty through cognitive, emotional, managerial, structural, ontological, and ep ep epistemological change processes. And in fact, um, researchers are now taking this one step further in developing an actual mindfulness intervention for this whole idea of environmental uh, sensibility. And they call it the Mindful Climate Action uh, intervention. And this is the intervention here. It's based upon mindfulness-based stress reduction. And you can see that there's eight sessions. Um, the sessions include uh, meditation as well as yoga practice, walking meditation, loving kindness meditation. And it includes weekly topics that are relevant uh, to the environment and climate change. Um, things like uh, mindful eating, sustainable lifestyles, water considerations, uh, energy conservation, climate connections, etc. And what they concluded from the two studies that are starting to work on this intervention, that the mindfulness climate action intervention was well received by participants as evidenced by high adherence rate, high measures of participant satisfaction, and high participant response rate for surveys. In addition, we, sex we successfully demonstrated feasibility of the MSA program. So this is actually a way for us uh, to, to uh, change uh, our relationship uh, as humans uh, with, with our environment and with the whole construct of climate change. So um, I have been funded by the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health for much of the research that I've done. Uh, this has supported both the insomnia research and the research on generalized anxiety disorder. I um, also work and, fu and funded with uh, the International Association of Yoga Therapists and I am also the director of research for the Kalini Research Institute, which supports the style of yoga that I practice. And I am also the director of yoga research for the Yoga Alliance. And my role in this organization is really to promote yoga research literacy. And we do this through yoga research videos, through over three dozen webinars that are freely accessible on YouTube, and through a whole uh, curated collection of yoga research reprints that are freely available uh, to the general population to uh, to, to look at what's been published uh, and read the, some of the studies that have been done uh, on yoga. So I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Because uh, that was, uh, Satpichi, that was an excellent presentation. Uh, amazing, I would say that you covered everything and I guess you answered most of my questions there, you know. So, uh, what we'll do is we'll take the questions so you can uh, please uh, 
leave your questions uh, in the chat or you can also raise your hand uh, there. Okay. You presented, uh, you, you presented a, a great deal of very interesting information. It's a great deal to absorb. Uh, I have to be mindful that it's a lot. Uh, perhaps one question might be about the fourth component uh, of the global um, spirituality. Is there any danger of perhaps being biased in terms of uh, analyzing this spiritual element? Um, well, it is, <clears throat> it's difficult to measure spirituality objectively. Um, and so, you know, we're going to be, you know, in that area, we're going to be relying upon self-report measures, but, and, and, you know, I have encountered many people who have said, you know, the spirituality component, you can't study. It's not possible to study that. It's too subtle. It's too etheric. It's too ephemeral. Uh, it's too deep. It's too profound. But the thing about psychological state and experience is that, is that if you can describe the experience, you can measure it. And so scientists have made really uh, substantial uh, uh, progress in characterizing these spiritual types of experiences, these mystical states. There's a sense of you know, the unitive state. There's a sense of timelessness. There's a sense of awe and reverence. There's a sense of a noetic experience of seeing sort of ultimate truth. And these characteristics have been put together uh, into a number of questionnaires that actually measure this transcendent state. Um, one of the questionnaires that looks at these eight sort of constructs that, that, that are there with the spiritual response is Hood's mysticism scale, uh, which actually quantifies one's uh, level of experience with those types of, uh, of states. So it is possible to do that work. Um, uh, now, if you're if you're querying people who are dedicated to yoga, obviously there's going to be a bias because yoga people read the yoga literature and say you're supposed to have a samadhi experience. So then if you give them a questionnaire on samadhi, oh yeah, of course I support samadhi, so I'm going to say that I, I've achieved samadhi. So there is a problem there. Um, uh, nevertheless, um, it, it is possible to, to, to make progress in this area. And at some point we will have objective measures because there are brain networks that are involved in this experience. And we know that because um, we can see these changes biologically with, with hallucinogens. And as though there's a body of research now with psychedelic agents like psilocybin that show that uh, maybe 40% of the people in these studies actually experience these mystical states. And these mystical states are really indistinguishable from those mystical states that we see in the literature. And they, they make the same kinds of long-term spiritual uh, changes in life purpose and meaning and goals in life that we see in, in sort of natural, spontaneous mystical experiences. Um, so we know that this is a product of, of brain functioning, and it's just a matter of time before we determine which kinds of networks in the brain are activated. And of course, this is really the goal of yoga. The goal of yoga is to optimize human brain and body functioning so that you are now in a more, more conducive state to experience these changes so that these brain regions could then be activated and give you this experience. It's very difficult to have a unitive experience if you've got low back pain. <laughs> so, you know, on a gross level, you're improving physiological function. And if you're depressed or anxious, again, it's very difficult to then activate these other brain regions that are going to give you this deeper experience. So you're optimizing uh, through meditative practices, you're optimizing your psychological functioning. And yoga is essentially a form of practical mysticism. Um, it's a set of practices that are designed to ultimate, ultimately achieve this state. And so we can measure it through self-report measures, which have some degree of bias. But ultimately, uh, I think there will be objective measures as well. I have no doubt about the uh, possibility of achieving mystical states through uh, assiduous uh, yoga practice. Uh, the question then comes in, though, where does the Samkhya philosophical school of thought from ancient Indian thinking come in where you have the distinction between Purusha and Prakriti? Yeah, those are subtleties that, that we'll have to wait, <laughs> and the research will have to catch up to that kind of thing. Um, you know, I think a lot of the mindfulness researchers are really sort of at the forefront of this because they're basically using advanced meditators as their tools for looking at these subtle issues. 
um, because these people have been practicing meditation for decades and they're the ones that know how the mind works and how these states um, can be entered into or exited from and and the subtleties of that so that that's 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 work that we really uh, are looking well into the future to, to, to try and uh, approach one more quick comment uh, I, my background is in comparative historical sociology and I'm a student of Max Weber's ideas uh, and uh, what he emphasizes is that the early origins of modern capitalism were spiritual. Hmm. Uh, for example, take the Quakers, highly spiritual, highly interdirected, very much in terms of uh, their ability to uh, self-reflect on their consciousness. And then what we today call capitalism is not what the early capitalism was when it was first mm -hmm. discovered. So I see a link there. I mean, one critique you might make of the materialism you mentioned is that it is no longer capitalism. Because capitalism relied on trust and honesty. And for example, one key ingredient was uh, when you sell something to someone who, who you don't know, uh, you give them essentially the same price as someone who's a co-religionist. Mm -hmm. The standard practice had always been that, that if someone is from your own community, you charge them much less. Now, having spent many uh, hours in Bali haggling, I know that a foreigner will still get a higher price, but nevertheless, in general, on average, there is this notion that a price is a, is a, is a fair price, regardless of the, the color of your skin or your gender or right. the languages you happen to not know. And so um, that was the earliest origin. So I think that's important as a, as a footnote to the concept of materialism, not to confuse the initial notions of, for example, the Quakers, I think that's a very simple example, uh, and other dissenting religions, really. Uh, and then, then you would get into the more complicated aspects of theology and metaphysics that obviously uh, you are hinting at when you talk about spirituality. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Sir, uh, Dr. Khalsa, my name is Shiv Tarwar. Thank you very much. It's a beautiful lecture. Very well illustrated, a lot of research, a lot of wisdom. Uh, my question is, application of yoga and pranayama in reducing racial uh, bigotry and inter-religious mm -hmm. bigotry, mm -hmm. I think those areas are so relevant uh, that we have to go out of way to study how the incidences of bigotry can be reduced, how people can learn to live overcoming unconscious bias. Yeah, I think, and I think it, it in one sense, it's very simple. Um, inherent in those types of situations is duality. It's you and them whether it's white and black, Catholic, Protestant, Sunni, Shiite, you name it, us versus them. That is inherent duality. Now, yoga is a practice which creates the unitive state. In the unitive state, there is no duality. There is just the experience of oneness. So that is at a, psycholo at a deep psychological level, really, in my mind, a solution to this. We've seen hints of this. I, we, you know, my laboratory has done studies on, on yoga in school settings, and one of the one of the anecdotal reports we get from the children that have been practicing yoga together is that some of the some of the differences between the students in the school, between the cliques in the school, uh, like the Browners versus the Jocks, they're practicing yoga together, and in that yoga environment, when they're experiencing at least close to that unitive state those distinctions start to disappear. Those barriers and those walls start to disappear because they're experiencing together something closer to that, to that unitive non-dual state. So I think yoga has a lot to offer in terms of that because you're really talking at the fundamental level of where these, um, where, where these differences are happening. It's, it's basically duality. I think there is another factor uh fear, um, especially fear of death. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt, 
uh, has studied uh, the use of guns uh, by the police in the United States mm -hmm. in, uh, in, uh, in um, unconscious bias, when you have a field of depth, you categorize people, blacks are categorized as people who are dangerous, can kill you, they may carry weapons and they are violent. And uh, uh, that categorization, bringing fear into the, into the, uh, the picture. And the same thing applies to Islamophobia. Uh, the fear of terrorism, fear of terrorism, fear of being killed is so strong that non-duality, I'm not sure whether, yet, uh, uh, until you directly experience non-duality, uh, just moving towards non-dual um, ideas may not be enough. It was an interesting construct, um, and and uh, I don't I don't know where to take it, um, but uh, certainly the 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 role of yoga is very clear in being able to reduce many types of psychological disturbance. And we're talking about anxiety, we're talking about depression, and I would classify fear as something else that is it can go into an abnormal state as well. And we've shown that these practices can normalize psychological functioning. So uh, I think that, that, that there is hope for fear as well. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you, sir. Um, I think the application um, of uh, yoga and pranayama uh, in reduction of incidences, we may not be able to totally eradicate, uh, uh, you know, uh, racial bigotry or Islamophobia or any other phobia for that matter, uh, but uh, it certainly can reduce. Uh, and I think research needs to be done in that area as well, or maybe promoted even. No, I think it'd be a great study to, to, to look at people who have that kind of bigotry and that kind of, um, you know, uh, negative relationship with some other type of body of people and see if a yoga intervention can actually make changes in that. That, that would be an interesting sociological study. Thank you. Alit, you're muted. Ask your question. <laughs> Monique, go ahead. Yeah, there's a question from Monique. Uh, the question is that curious about any research you might have done on the pineal gland and its connection to spiritual awakening. Well, of course, in the yoga literature, that's that's front and center. Everybody's talking about the pineal gland as the third eye. Uh, in fact, it was a third eye in reptiles. Uh, it is a vestigial third eye in humans. Um, the pineal gland has has significant um, effects on with respect to sleep and circadian rhythmicity. That is its evolutionary development uh, as a as a mechanism participating in the biological clock. However, in terms of you know the pineal gland and spirituality, um, although there are papers that have been published that suggest that yoga or meditation interventions have improved levels of melatonin. Um, most of those papers are seriously flawed. And I have not yet seen studies that have convincingly demonstrated that um, the pineal gland change in melatonin output is associated with uh, improvements in deeper things like spirituality. Um, the problem is that there's a, co there's a confounding factor here. So yoga is going to improve sleep quality. And as you improve sleep quality, you improve melatonin levels because you're less likely to get up in the middle of the night and be exposed to light. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yoga will improve sleep, but is is that and and therefore melatonin? But is that coincident with improvement in spirituality? And and that remains to be determined. So I'm not convinced that there's 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 research that really 
uh, nails this down that, that, that the pineal is, is associated with, with spirituality. There are people who um, don't have pineals, who have had pineal, have had brain accidents in which their pineal is destroyed. They're still functional individuals uh, and may well be capable of experiencing unitive states of consciousness. So um, the evidence is not there at this point, as, in my opinion. Great answer on that, <laughs> the confounding there. Uh, there is another interesting question from Sheila O'Reilly. Uh, she says, how then might we encourage politicians and policy makers to take up yoga? Ah, Do you yes. have any examples of specific yoga practitioners working for the environment? Yes, I know of one who, who teaches in Congress in the United States and teaches yoga um, to, to congressional staff and perhaps even congressmen. So, so there are people uh, in, in Washington, D.C. who are, are, are teaching yoga. It is becoming more popular that 14% of the population will cut across politicians as well, uh, especially since politicians meet the criteria. They're more educated, they're more affluent, they're more likely to hear about yoga and, and be exposed to the practice of yoga. So, so, so it is being it is being practiced, but how we can then move into that a little bit more needs more work. There's actually a congressman, Tim Ryan, who is famous now for promoting mindfulness. He's written a book on mindfulness and uh, is one of the leading proponents of of the whole construct of mindfulness uh, practices, meditation practices. So, um, there is some 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 activity in that way. And of course, in Canada, uh, my home country, you now have. Uh, the son of a prime minister I voted for, uh, uh, Trudeau, um, uh, who is an active yoga practitioner. So it, it is possible. Um, prime Minister Modi, another example of someone who's deeply dedicated to yoga practice. That's wonderful. So we are a little bit over time, uh, Dr. Khalsa. Uh, I don't know if you have more time or not. Uh, I'm happy we, to continue. You are okay with that? So yes, uh, if you have anybody have any questions, all I hear is just amazing presentation. Perhaps they have not seen anything like that before, uh, including me, especially on the science uh, of, of the yoga, you know, and all the studies that have been done, you know. Um, Vedahi, okay, you have, okay, go ahead, Vedahi. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Kausa, it was an excellent presentation. I have been practicing yoga on and off uh, since 2018, uh, but I think I'm very much sold on the whole thing. Then for a person who is aware of the benefits, but also starting to do that and then slipping off the routine and come back, what kind of uh, advice you can give for the person to pick it up? I'm motivated. I want to continue. But the days I meditate, I feel very grounded. But there are, I'm a morning person. If I miss my five to six o'clock meditation, and when the time goes past seven o'clock, I'm not able to sit down. So, what kind of a recommendation or advice you can give me? Well, that's not an area of my expertise, but I can speak personally. Um, uh, you know, different people have different levels of engagement with yoga and mind-body practices. Some people really want to spend all of their time <laughs> meditating and, and doing yoga, and, and they're constantly driven to do that, and it's automatic whenever they get the opportunity. Their spouses complain that they're meditating or practicing yoga too much. And then there are people, and I tend to fall in this more category, that I need to have some kind of structure or motivation to engage in my practice. Um, if, if left to my own, I would not practice. Um, so, so I end up having to structure things. And structural things are like you, you get committed to a, a yoga class, for example, uh, to a group yoga class that happens on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6 p.m. And that becomes a routine. It becomes a commitment. And suddenly, that is what maintains your practice and gets you to do the practice. And whatever kind of commitment you can engage in or, or, or group class or uh, even online class to help you um, maintain your routine will be helpful um, because many people do 
uh, enjoy group yoga practices. And these days, of course, with Zoom, I think I think many people are probably you know practicing together in a group group environment, which enhances compliance. And we know this is true from research because group interventions have that effect. They create a group relationship, which then um, people will use to help them engage in the practice and maintain regularity of practice. That is the weakness of these practices. You actually have to do something. And so the question is, how do you get yourself to do that more regularly, uh, sufficiently to, to, to really get benefit? Thank you. I also have one other question. Uh, I, I, I started doing Anapana of the, through the Vipassana meditation. That appealed to me very much because it guides you to focus on the breath. And that works wonders for me. So in the beginning of your presentation, you did mention that uh, um, you, know, you can focus on a mantra target of different types and things like that. To me, they are distractors focusing on the breath. Just like in your yoga demonstration, you kept emphasizing if your mind wanders, focus on the breath. So when focus on the breath seems to be the thing, the ultimate thing that would help a person in being uh, fully immersed, uh, do you think focusing on the targets and other or uh, chanting a mantra and other things are as effective as the uh, focusing on the breath? Thank you. So I think I think there's going to be a lot of commonality uh, regardless of what you focus on. Um, okay. So the commonality is going to outweigh the differences. Will there be differences between mindfulness meditation and concentrative meditation? Absolutely. Dif different regions of the brain will be affected slightly differently. But the overall effects are largely going to be the same. You're going to, in you're going to induce the relaxation response. You're going to engage in self-regulation. You're going to improve your mindfulness and mind-body awareness overall. And really what's m what, what matters more is personal preference. Uh, you should do what feels good for you and yeah. what you benefit from because that's yeah. what's going to keep you engaged. Yeah. And I can see that, every one of them is a step in the right direction. You know. So, so different people practice different styles of yoga and they swear by those different styles of yoga. And that's fine. Different people have different preferences. Some people want to do hot yoga. Some people want to do meditative yoga. Uh, it's, it's, it's personal preference. And that is very important because if you're, you're engaging in a practice that's good for you and feels good for you, that's going to improve your compliance uh, and your engagement, which is, which is what it's all about. I mean, it's it's all about the practice. Thank you. Um, I've got a question if I can ask it. Is that okay, Monique, or is there anybody else in line? Um, I was interested in when we did our practice, you would say, breathe in at this point, breathe out at that point, and then there was some point where we would hold our inhalation, and then we would return to a natural breath. Um, I wonder whether there have been studies done on the effects on the brain during the inhalation, the effects on the brain during the exhalation, and in particular, the held inhalation and the held exhalation. Not yet. I mean, those are subtleties that 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 people are working on. And, you know, whether Kumbach is is uh, you know has a specific effect on on um, gas levels, on on blood gas levels, carbon dioxide and oxygen, or whether it has specific effects on on brain functioning. Those are subtleties we've yet to um, to elucidate. Uh, we're just starting to get into research that's starting to look at all the different varieties of pranayama practice, kapalabhati, bastraka, and so on, uh, alternate nostril breathing, um, and, and trying to tease apart what the different effects are from these. And there's a commonality between all of them, and that is induction of the relaxation response, reduction of stress regulation, improvement in pain regulation, all of those things that I showed in the logic model. And then on top of that is the specificities. What are the specificities of alternate nostril breathing? Are you activating different hemispheres of the brain? Are you activating different types of um, functioning in different ways? And, and, and that research is, is ongoing. That's great, thanks. 
there is a question in the chat. I'm not certain if I understand. I'll just read it to you. Maybe you'll understand. Thank you for the amazing presentation. Um, you might have mentioned it, but I'm mostly wondering if a long practice of yoga can result in the body getting used to or getting into a plateau state in the copying mechanism from stress and anxiety, meaning that at a certain point, one cannot keep decreasing the frequency and intensity of anxious states. Did you get that? I, yeah, I don't really understand what, what the question is trying to get at. The more you practice yoga, the more you're going to reduce your stress and anxiety state. And as long as you continue to practice, you will maintain that low level of stress and anxiety because you're maintaining a skill set of how your body and brain uh, cope with stress and emotion. And that's really what, that's what it's really all about. Um, uh, some people may get more benefit out of yoga. They practice yoga for a while and then they're, they're improved. They don't have to practice as much to stay improved. Other people will have to practice more. Uh, and it depends upon a variety of factors. It depends on your genetics. It depends upon your upbringing. Were you traumatized as a child, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of factors that go into individual circumstances. So different people will have different levels of practice that keep them functional on an ongoing basis. Some people need to practice every day in order just to keep themselves from going into deep depression. Other people can do one hour a week and, and are doing fine. So it, it really is very inter-individual. But the bottom line is that the more you practice, the more you're going to reduce the levels of, of um, uh, aberrant psychological states like anxiety and depression uh, and reduce your stress levels. I just wanted to share one thing that uh, uh, this speaker series is sponsored by Wellness at Work, University of Guelph, and hosted by University of Guelph Yoga and Meditation Collective, you know. And we have been uh, teaching free, you know, we are a volunteer organization. We have been teaching free over uh, last 10 years, you know. And currently we have three classes that you can join, you know. So we are teaching on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, Tuesday and Thursday at 12 noon for one hour. And uh, Wednesday, people who are early risers, it's from six to seven, you know, it's a free class, anybody can join, you know. Any other questions? Is there any question? You can you can just you know ask you know just uh, ask. May, may I? I've already spoken a lot, but may I lull it? Yeah, sure. No <laughs> defending anyway. <laughs> okay, one more, last one. <laughs> well, I don't want so Dr. Hans Becker is one of us. I, I would speakers. just like to say uh, that your talk was excellent. I really enjoyed it. Many people have said the same thing in the chat. Uh, I happen to be in Boston right now, and I'm often at the Brigham and Women with my uh, wife. Oh. Uh, she was formerly employed at Harvard Medical School. Hmm. Her PhD is in psychology. I would very much like it if we could uh, have a tea and have a chat, or perhaps just communicate by email. Sounds wonderful. Yes. And, and uh, Lalit has my email address, so happy to... to work with you. Thank you. I, I would I would appreciate that. Um, I have a lot of ideas floating around in my head. Uh, I thought your talk was absolutely uh, perfect uh, as a talk. Uh, and you raised so many interesting questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I would uh, reiterate what Dr. Barker said that it is not excellent. It's a perfect talk. And what I find in this presentation that I really don't find many is that you are so clear. The clarity is absolute. And thank you very much for that. <laughs> thank you very much for that. Uh, if you don't have any question, uh, I mean, you can always just you know, say that uh, you have a question. If not, then we will close this session. Uh, Dr. Sabir Khalsa is very close to our heart and soul. So he's available anytime. And he has actually told that he will come to our uh, panel discussion in September, you know. Uh, Dr. Sabir Khalsa, this is your home. 
come to Guelph anytime, our homes are open for you. Uh, and finally, I want to thank our Yoga Collective volunteers, you know, without which this would not have been possible, especially Jacqueline, Annette, and Monique is one of our uh, very high serving. <laughs> the service is the, uh, is the order, you know. So thank you very much. And uh, please come again. We have a next uh, series, uh, next event uh, scheduled for June, but we'll have some, someone come in between there in April or May. Thank you very much. So now go and uh, do some yoga and meditation. <laughs> <laughs> Also, if you want to um, see this video again, it, or this, this series again, we are posting it on YouTube, I believe, Lily, to under the Yoga Meditation Collective. Yes, yes. And uh, yeah. as I said, and I'll leave your email here. We can contact you directly. If you have any question, you know, for Dr. Khalsa or for us, you know, just leave your email and then we will get back to you. <clears throat> Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you to all the listeners and all the people who came to see this amazing presentation. And I'm sure that all your questions are answered. <laughs> Thank you. Namaste. Bye. Namaste. All the best. Namaste. Namaste.